Good afternoon, Canucks fans, and welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation, brought to you, as always, by the 2024 Toyota BZ4X. i got to tell you all about the BZ4X. The BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech, but still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain, whether it's rain, snow, mud, a Norris Trophy conversation, uh, the BZ4X will get you through it all. And of course, we are coming to you from the lower lobby of the iconic Wall Center in downtown Vancouver. Looking for your next meeting space, contact the Wall Center for all your event needs at sales at wallcenter.com. Dave Quadrelli, alongside Harmon Dial, our technical producer, the man at the controls, is Grady Sass. We're going to be joined in a matter of moments. Quick start to today's show. Uh, by Frank Saravalli, who we're going to talk to, obviously, about the Norris Trophy. That's the big thing everybody wants to talk about. But also, Frank had a report today that we're very curious to dive into a bit more, and that is about the Arizona Coyotes potentially relocating, excuse me, being sold and then relocated to uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. So lots to get to there. Um, I'm very, very excited for this conversation with Frank. Yeah, bombshell reporting, uh, excellent reporting by Frank. And you're just trying to butter him up before you start throwing noise. No, <laughs> no, it's legit. I mean, he's yeah, the one that is. broke the of news. Course. It's yeah. the talk of uh, the entire hockey world today. And it feels like it's been moving quickly. And yet, based off our conversations earlier in the year with Frank, it's felt like this has been a possibility for, for quite some time. Okay. Frank's going to join us. He's already here. He's early. Look at him go. Look at him go. Uh, Frank Saravelli is brought to you by the Wendy's Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool game. The only thing sweeter than the taste of victory is starting your day with the new Cinnabon pull apart from Wendy's. But there's no reason that you can't have both because Wendy's and Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool are giving you a chance to win weekly prizes all season long. And hey, even if you make a few wrong picks, at least you know heading to Wendy's right now for a $5 Cinnabon pull apart and small coffee is a great choice. Sign up for Daily Face Off Survivor Pool Fantasy today, sponsored by Wendy's and the Wendy's app. <clears throat> wow. All right, let's bring him in. Uh, Frank Saravalli joins us now. We're very, very excited to have him on the show. Uh, Frank, thanks so much for joining us. What the hell can you tell us about the Arizona Coyotes? Oh, man, what a day. Uh, look, Here's the best way I can frame it. Um, the Arizona Coyotes and Ryan Smith of the Smith Entertainment Group in Salt Lake City are well down the track on an agreement with the NHL, which would see the franchise be sold and relocated to Salt Lake City in time for next season's play. Um, this has been in the works for a couple weeks. I've mentioned a bunch of this in my reporting, much to the chagrin of Coyotes fans who kept calling me a hater, and that's fine. <laughs> Um, I actually feel bad for them and the spot that they're in as fans. Um, but nonetheless, um, not done, but certainly well on the path. If this, if the Coyotes do end up in Salt Lake City with a new owner, uh, a more st stable future, what could that mean even from an on ice perspective, a roster building perspective, just because Arizona for so many years now has been just hoarding a million draft picks, taking on a bunch of dead contracts and feels like they've been unable to get out of that rebuilding phase. Is, th is this good news for them from an on ice team building perspective? To be fair, Harm, I, I think that the on ice portion of what the Coyotes have been working on hasn't really been touched, so to speak. Like I think that they've sort of been able to operate and do a pretty nice job, all things considered, um, player, I'd say player recruitment wise. I mean, think about how hard it might have been if you're Bill Armstrong, the GM to recruit free agents. Think about how difficult it might have been to engage with future lottery picks. The Coyotes picked at six and 12 last year. They ended up selecting two Russians um, because there might have been some players that were like, hey, that's the last place I want to go with their uncertain future. So I, I think they've, They've got some real nice foundational pieces. Um, Logan Cooley certainly, you know, jumps to the top of my mind when I think about that. And and Clayton Keller and and Lawson Kraus and and the guys that they do have. I'd include Sean Dersey in that category too. Um, and then the prospects, the draft picks that you mentioned. Like, if I'm Ryan Smith in Salt Lake City, I am over the moon excited to have this as my starting point as opposed to starting from absolute scratch with an expansion franchise. Um, this is way 
better to deal with. I think it's way quicker on the ascent. You have potentially a place with some excitement and could provide some energy and shot in the arm in the around the league that, Hey, like this could be a real destination place that players want to play. And so in the meantime, it's about kind of doing it the right way and putting all the pieces together in the proper order. But I think with some stability there, it could drastically change the fortunes on ice success wise of this franchise moving forward. That's a really interesting way to look at it because you think about from an operating perspective, low payroll, like you're not going to have crazy operating costs and you could have some on ice success, which would obviously uh, bring you a lot of revenue. So yeah, definitely a very uh, interesting situation to follow. Is there anything else? Well, I was going to say, I don't think that that operating cost would be an issue for Ryan Smith. Like this guy is a legit billionaire that already owns an NBA team. Like he understands how to operate a pro sports franchise isn't going into this blind. So um, I'd envision, you know, without having talked to Ryan Smith or knowing his game plan, why wouldn't they want to jump to be closer to being a cap, you know, cap spending team. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just so many, you're going to have so many impact players on such low dollar values that you, you could, you could turn this around really quickly. Anything else we should know about this, Frank, before we move topics? I would say, uh, look, not done, but certainly, um, trending in that direction. I, you know, we can quibble over what that means. Is there a verbal agreement in place? Are they close to one? Here's what I know is that there are no signatures. There's no paper. Uh, They want to try and get that done as soon as possible. A lot of people seem to think that uh, April 18th is the day. Um, I I mentioned that in the story this morning. And so we'll see. But I'd, I'd say if you were to ask me what percentage chance I think the Coyotes will be playing in Salt Lake City next year, my answer would be like 90 to 95. Hmm. That's a hot, that's a high number. Okay, people are calling us cowards in the chat for not uh, already asking you about it, but you made some headlines last week in Vancouver, Frank, uh, when you said it's a close, close race between Kale McCarr and Quinn Hughes for the Norris. We spent all of last week talking about how it shouldn't be close from a statistical perspective, but I found your take interesting because it does give you that sense, that broader kind of sense of around the league, not just Vancouver. There's a lot of voters around the league. Uh, How do you look at the Norris debate right now? Well, it's really interesting to listen. And I'm not saying anyone's wrong, by the way. I'm just, it's interesting to listen to the sicko fans that I would say are part of who are commenting here because I had some guy tweeting at me saying, if Quinn Hughes isn't your Norris trophy vote, then you shouldn't get a vote. And I'm just thinking to myself, that's not really how voting works. <laughs> like, if we all thought the same and believed the same, what would be the incentive or point to vote? And so I would say outside of the bubble of your market, and I think there's a ton of great points to make. And, and I would say having spent a lot of time this past weekend after making those comments, studying some of the metrics and numbers, um, I would say I'm leaning to toward Quinn Hughes. But to say that it's like, this isn't a debate. Why are we even talking about this? Can't believe that you know, there, there's only one candidate here. Like that's not how people are viewing it outside of your bubble. So, um, what ends up happening? I I have no idea. Again, that's why we vote, but I don't, I don't view it kind of quite clearly and cut as dry, cut and dry as everyone else might. Yeah. Frank, the, the way I kind of look at it is offensively, obviously Hughes and McCarr, the difference between them is probably going to be negligible, right? They're going to finish with basically identical uh, point totals. But where I think Hughes may separate himself from Makar this year uh, is, A, he's been substantially better defensively by sort of every measure, whether it's goals against, shots against, chances against. And so you look at that defensive zone impact, um, I think there's a sig- significant edge there. And then the second point that uh, that I think um, voters should consider is that Makar's results are likely propped up to some extent by um, Nathan McKinnon, it's interesting that almost 70% of Makar's five on five ice time has, um, has been alongside McKinnon, who's probably at this point, the front runner to win the Hart trophy. And here's a catch. I, I don't know if many people know this Makar's results this year actually fall off a cliff away from McKinnon. So you look at 
when McCarr is away from McKinnon at five on five this season, the Avs have actually been outscored 21 to 14, right? Whereas Quinn, on the other hand, A, he doesn't have a, a forward of McKinnon's caliber to play with. Uh, and then B, his numbers are consistently elite, regardless of whether he's played with Vancouver's first line, second line, third line, fourth line. So I think that's where, in terms of defensive and all around impact, uh, Hughes, I think, has a decisive edge. But I can see why, for a lot of other people outside, outside of the market, that it is close, even though, um, yeah, I, I, I think it should be Hughes. So all fair points. Um, I did know that McCarr's numbers were not as good with McKinnon. I would say in response to that, that I don't know that McKinnon is as much of a slam dunk again, as a lot of people are saying with the heart. This is another good example because you, if you scroll through social media, watching McKinnon get the hat trick last night, people are like, look at this guy bullying his way through the rest of the league. Absolutely deserves it. I think people are so kind of drunk on the style in a good way that McKinnon has that it's trumping or um, it's more visible. It's right in front of your face than what Nikita Kucherov is doing, for instance, mm. in Tampa. He's 53 points of his next clear of his next closest teammate. He continues night after night to do something special. His numbers this season against top 10 opponents in the league, he's averaging north of two points per game. The other guys have feasted more on teams toward the bottom of the standings. Does that matter? I don't know. Um, Nathan McKinnon and Connor McDavid, they both have 100-point teammates that they play frequently with. Like, There's a million factors, and that's just the hard part of it. Now, without me stepping onto a landmine and having an honest sort of, hey, I haven't done any prep on this, Parm, <laughs> give me the details on how Quinn Hughes has fared with and without Philip Aronik they haven't really spent much time apart this year uh i can quickly look it up i can find that we did that at canucks army the answer ended up being all i remember is that heronic got substantially worse and you put quinn hughes with like noah Juleson, and it was the same results and okay and see that's in another that that would be another important data point to me as i consider this moving forward because here's one of the other things that i've been wrestling with and we've had this conversation when it came to heronic and the contract talk that I don't, I'm not bringing it back to him, but I, I think what you try and do when you're sizing up someone's season is also sort of isolate some of the other factors if you can. Quinn Hughes has taken an enormous step forward this season, you know, compared to some others in his career. What has been some of the different factors comparing this year to last? What do you think would be the biggest reason why? Quinn Hughes has had so much more success. I'm asking an open-ended question this year than last year or the year prior. It, it has been that he's had a chance to, to play with Philip Ronick, whereas in the past he hasn't had, you know, outside of his rookie year with Tanev, a legit top four caliber partner. And I think in relation to the Norris conversation, um, the counter argument would be, well, Kale McCarr gets to play with Devon Taves, who I think most would take, Taves over Heronic um, as, a, as a defenseman. I just want to be clear. Like, I'm not taking anything away from Hughes when I ask that question. I'm just saying, in general, I'd love to try and figure out why he was able to take such part of it's going to be on him. Part of it's just going to be environment, too, right? And that goes for any player that has that jump. Like I said, I'm leaning towards Quinn Hughes. Um, I just don't think it's like Quinn Hughes here and then Kel Lacar 24% behind. That's not how I view it. I don't know that anyone reasonably outside of Vancouver is looking at it in a different way. I also think it has a lot to do with um, the coaching. Like, I think they've had a much better defensive system this year, which has helped Quinn Hughes a lot. Um, and that's why I think you still see those results, even if he's not with Philip Peronic. Um, And I don't know why I can't figure it out, but I was on, I was on, um, What's that site? Not natural staff. I'm trying to figure out how to do the with and without thing. I don't, I haven't done it in a while. I can't remember how to get it. I also think um, to, to further uh, sort of answer your, your question about what's perhaps changed this, this season. I think it is interesting. Like I wonder if part of it isn't so much. Yeah. Like Quinn Hughes has definitely leveled up this year, but he was also spectacular last year. I would argue borderline top five defenseman last season, but because the Canucks were so brutal, he didn't have that narrative going for him, right? Like he it's didn't hard have the to... point total either in the production. 
It was good, yeah. but it wasn't this. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's a good point. He even brought it up last year. Like he was asked about the Norris and he just he didn't he didn't really want to talk about it. He just said, like, I think you have to be on a winning team to win those awards. Like that was yeah, his and answer. I, I think that's a big reason it. why like the narrative is much stronger this year is he's now captaining a winning team, whereas in years past the Canucks have been a dumpster fire. All fair points. Um, but I think this is why it's fun. It is fun. I can't find this. I'm sorry, guys. I was really trying to find the exact numbers. Harry, can you just find it on natural stats? Okay. Yeah. You know Dude, it's so site. wild to me, though, like how, in, in a way, I love the, like, passion. But it, on another yeah. hand, I'm, like, slightly alarmed by the vitriol that's like, look at this guy. He's an absolute Canuck hater. And it's like, dude, I, I don't, I, I promise you, I don't care. Here's um, the thing, Frank. I want to try and yeah. fill out the best, most informed ballot I can, which is yeah. why I don't. I also don't generally give out my picks before because I want the reserve the right to change them as I get closer to, you know, ballots are going out yeah. on Friday. Uh, both of you gentlemen will re be receiving one and we've got a, you know, another week beyond that to figure it out. We've got nine days and I intend to use eight and a half of them to get there. So I quickly looked it up. Uh, Hughes's numbers, uh, five on five in about 325 minutes uh, away from Hironic are actually slightly better. Um, outscored opponents 17 to seven at five on five and uh, controlling 61% of scoring chances. So uh, Hughes's numbers have been elite with Hironic and without him. I That's why I prefaced my question without stepping on a landmine. I wasn't asking it in a way that shaded the answer it was a legitimate hey that's another important data point that is a nice check mark in quinn hughes column i'm going to give you uh, another answer to one of your questions and frankie i know i know you got to go but the the reason that there's the vitriol in defense of canucks fans and i know people say some pretty awful things so i'm not defending those people but the reason canucks fans are so riled up about this part of the reason they saw daniel sedin get robbed of the MVP, the heart, heart, uh, heart trophy in 2010, 11, losing it to Corey Perry, who had less points, arguably less impact on his team. He had 50 goals. Of course, uh, again, I think that was cited as, Oh, well, he's got more goals. It's, he's got to win the heart. Uh, I, I, I would argue that Daniel Sedin definitely deserved to win the heart trophy in 2010, 11. Look, I'm just trying to be a Lieutenant in the Canuck <laughs> army. So whatever that requires, <laughs> We appreciate your time, Frank. And, and we're looking forward to this uh, Arizona report, kind of what comes of it next. Great reporting again, Frank. We really appreciate you taking the time and we appreciate you uh, entertaining us on this Norris Trophy conversation. See you guys. Thanks, Frank. There he is. Frank Cervall. You can check him out all over Daily Face Off. Everybody knows that. Um, but yeah, good chat. Good chat with Frank. And it, you guys were way too cordial. I mean, it's. I wanted to be like way more fireworks. I thought I was going to get to, you know, talk a lot more about how you guys hate each other. I didn't get that vibe. Because we don't, right? And, um, and you heard Frank. He's leaning towards Quinn now. So I think uh, all, all the people or, or all the reaction to... Well, he did say he looked into it in the weekend. Yeah. And I think once you do really, really dive into it, exactly. kind of as you just did, and, and like... Look, this is, and it's so funny because everybody's gonna be like, "Oh, see, Frank, blah blah blah." We're voting. I gave what's his face? Who's the who's the guy I gave a lady Bing vote to? And I admitted I just completely screwed up the vote. It was my first year voting. Biggest mistake I've made. Oh, was it some D man? Uh, Tobias Bjorn funds. <laughs> <laughs> I gave Tobias, and I'll own it. I'll own it. It was a mistake. I gave Tobias Bjorn foot. <laughs> what did I vote for? The lady Bing, I think I was like, oh, I don't know. I gave him like a fourth or fifth place vote. It was it was insignificant, but I still really think about that and say, OK, there's blind spots. I'm not watching every L.A. Kings game. I'm not watching every hockey game that's played. We're trying to make the we're trying to vote as best we can. Like I, I maybe there's some people. But I don't think anybody's going in there and just like, all right, I like this player. I like this player. I like this player. Yeah, that's that's my vote. I don't think anybody's doing that, but sometimes our process of how we land on things is inherently flawed. So, again, like, Tobias Bjorn fought really low penalty minutes, played some solid hockey, really low penalty minutes, but the definition of the award, which you have to go by, is playing at a high level. Did Tobias Bjorn fought, who right now is playing in the AHL, did he play at that high of a level when I threw him on my ballot? 
he was a rookie. I got excited about that or excuse me, sophomore, but still like I I've, I've made mistakes too. Um, and I'm not saying that if, if kill McCarr gets first place votes, that voters making a mistake. I'm just saying that it's impossible to dive as deep as we have into the Norris debate. And I, I think it's beneficial for Quinn Hughes's Norris chances that we have, you know, we've dove into this so much and done it so loudly that a lot of people are going to start to really understand how deserving Quinn Hughes is of this award. Um, Again, I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back or be like, all right, Quinn should uh, Quinn should be thanking us. Nothing like that. That's all Service to the community. Yeah, serve <laughs> the community. That's right. No, I'm just saying that um, as Frank said, like Frank's trying to learn everything he can. Yeah. And that's like, you know, this this level of arrogance from some people that they know everything and oh yeah, I can't I can't have my mind changed. Like you should be looking to learn. And I don't want to get into philosophical conversations here, but again. Me and the other great thinkers. By the way, I, I think it's hilarious that you spent five minutes fumbling around a natural stat trick and could figure yeah. out how to get the width <laughs> and without you stats. Someone pointed out. Someone in the chat. Someone in the chat pointed out that my focused face looks like I'm taking a dump. And if you go back on the YouTube show, I was going to sure. do it originally. You're like, nope, I'm saving the day. I'm saving the day. I thought I'd get it done faster. Quads, that's why you're the vibes guy and harms the numbers guy. It shows you how long it's been since I uh, did one of those articles where it's like, look how good this person is with this person. And, and just to circle back on that a bit, Harm, we'll close out the Norris conversation here. But did you say Quinn Hughes has been better without Philip Ronick? Yeah, his numbers are slightly better. <laughs> but again, it's a small sample. I think the main point is just in the minutes that her... Hughes hasn't had Heronic, his play hasn't slipped at all because uh, you look at, again, Hughes away from Heronic, controlled 59% of shot attempts, uh, 61% of scoring chances, 62% of high danger chances, and the goals are 17 to 7 at 5 and 5. Someone in the chat looked it up. Whew. I'm just going to show you. Look at Tobias Bjornfot's ho hockey reference page. Under awards. Oh my god, he has a 51st place. So, so it's Jacoby. Put this in the chat. I'm gonna find a screen grab and I'll I, pull it up. I here. think he's I think I think he's correct on this, but this is what he said. Quads, your bing vote for Bjornfoot ranked him 51st for the award, and it's the only note on his hockey reference page. You made a measurable impact. <laughs> I'm curious, and you'd have to go back. I don't think you could do it. Um, it, it'd take a while, but Someone out there can figure it out. That might be the only vote Tobias Bjornfot's ever gotten in his career. On anything. Probably. By like the it way, might be his only vote for the Bing, finishing 51st overall. It might be, he, he might have just had, that was the only vote. So, Tuka Rask, okay. in his uh, final season, because I believe he had some type of return, got hurt, uh, played four games, two and two with an 844 save percentage. Mm -hmm. Uh, under the awards page of Hockey Reference, he's he he's eleventh uh, for uh, the All Star All Star voting or okay. not the All Star game voting. Oh, we the All Star like, yeah, the yeah, we get. The team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, because it turns out someone voted for him uh, as one of the three goalies. Jack Edwards after playing four <laughs> games and having an eight forty four save percentage. Do you have a Do you have any blunder? Oh your, yeah, like so, voting. Oh yeah, this this is super embarrassing. So. Last year, I knew Kuzmenko wasn't Calder eligible, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't have him on my Calder ballot. But when you go down to the, like, your first year ballot, I thought first year oh, that you didn't have to be Calder. It's the all-rookie team. Right. So yes. I didn't think it was, like, all-rookie. It was just first year. Oh, no. And so... Did I, that void your entire ballot? I don't know, to be I, honest. It, it, was, it was a bad mistake. That is a bad mistake. And I think, and again... Thank you for opening up. But I, I, I think maybe, damn, we should get Frank back on. But I think if you make a mistake, they're just like, yeah, your, your ballot's void. I know if you don't get it in on time, you obviously, you, nothing gets counted. But I'm just looking here, quads. Hockey reference says you had him third. No. Can you confirm or deny? Let me see if I can find it in my notes app. I don't think and I there's, third. there's five spots for those ones. Can you, can you pull up my whole ballot or no? I'm trying to dig that up right okay. here. I don't think I, I thought I had him fourth or fifth. I know I voted Jack Hughes number 
one i got a lot of devils fans being like that's a good pick and it was it I, was a good pick. that was a good pick and it was me and dom lecision were like the only people that picked jackie i think you might have as well. I, I had him somewhere yeah on my, uh, i had him bing. number one on my uh lady bing and again this is just to say like we all make mistakes and we all want to learn more um i didn't do nearly enough research on my lady bing ballot that year and that, again that was my first year voting it was a mistake and i'll own up to it and i uh I promise I won't vote for Tobias Bjornfoot ever again, unless he really deserves it, like he did in his rookie year. I promise I'll get the first year rookie criteria right. There we go. See, everybody's owning up to their mistakes here. And, and hey, Frank, Frank just told us we're getting ballots on this year. So good thing he's just not listening anymore. And I was just being like, yeah, I was the guy that voted Tobias Bjornfoot. Yeah, I put a void ballot in. Great times, great times here on Canucks Convo. Okay, I have to tell you about something I'm very excited to tell you about. And that is the Canucks Army playoff shirt. The playoffs are near and we have an army. Nation Gear is ready to gear you up for Vancouver's playoff run. Rep your favorite team as they battle for the cup. Shop the exclusive We Have an Army playoff tee and more at nationgear.ca. Okay, Harm, did you know that today is a game day? Because after that chat, us being in studio, we didn't do today's show remotely because we had this chat with Frank. And that was great, by the way. I really enjoyed that. Um... The Canucks play the Arizona Coyotes tonight. 7.30 start at Rogers Arena. I ask you this every time it's a game day. What can the Vancouver Canucks expect from the Arizona Coyotes? I, I, I'm honestly not preoccupied with what I'm expecting of the Arizona Coyotes. I'm more focused on another start, it sounds like, for Archer Seelovs, which yes. I'm excited for. And yes. I think on merit, we all knew that he deserved another start, but part of me was still unsure if they'd actually commit to that because... Smith is the veteran, and if he's the guy that you turn to in case of injury in the playoffs, do you want to give him a chance to sort of redeem himself? So I, I like, uh, and I'm curious to see how C. Loves does in his second consecutive start there. And there's a chance that we see Elias Lindholm yes. uh, tonight uh, mm -hmm. as well. So from that perspective, of course, him playing through that wrist injury, it at least provides some context for why he was struggling offensively yes. uh, for a while. Um, he's obviously going to be an asset for the Canucks PK. And I'm curious to see what type of workload he gets uh, if he draws into the lineup in, in the sense that is he immediately going to land for yeah. shoot a PK and uh, log a ton of minutes, uh, even strength. I, I don't suspect we'll see him on the first unit power play, but uh, will we see him on the second unit? Uh, and will they have an eye on carefully managing yeah. uh, his minutes? So those are the factors I'm mostly sort of keeping in my mind heading into this game and from Arizona's perspective look they're not going to be an easy out they aren't a team that uh that rolls over yep. last time of course they worked hard Connor they, they, Ingram baby Connor Ingram was um was spectacular so uh the Canucks are going to be going to have to be focused and I think it's an interesting test from that perspective because the Canucks you, you could almost sense that the market took a sigh of relief after oh, they beat absolutely. Vegas. Right? So there's less urgency on, oh, hey, you have to beat Arizona. Whereas if they lost to Vegas, um, there would have been a lot of heat and sort of anxiety and, and sort of pressure that, oh, you have to win this one. Uh, whereas now there's some pressure off, uh, especially now that um, there's some breathing room in the Pacific Division lead as well. There isn't too much pressure from that. So you have to be careful not to let it become a trap game. Absolutely. Um, you also have to be careful that Connor Ingram can't goalie you tonight. But again, you talked about the sigh of relief. Vegas is in Edmonton tonight. Edmonton's without Connor McDavid. The Pacific Division is basically wrapped up for the Canucks, you would hope. Knock on wood. But that win against Vegas mattered for a ton of reasons, that being a big one. And hey, I said it. I, I'll tell you the vibes pick tonight is that the Golden Knights go in and stomp the Edmonton Oilers. That's the vibe pick tonight. Aiden Hill's back in goal for the Golden Knights. Didn't even know that. Still the vibe pick. Yeah, I uh, that would be great because it would all but uh, lock that first place in the division up. And it's interesting hearing Zach Hyman, I think a day or two ago in uh, Daniel Nugent Bowman's article at The Athletic speaking about how they believe they can catch the Canucks for first place in the division. Okay, Zach. Uh, and how it sort of increases the stakes for them down the stretch. Mm -hmm. So if you know Edmonton's even semi-competitive about it, that the Canucks, on the other hand, having held the division lead for so long, yeah. especially how large that gap was early in the season, they're not going to want any type of scenario where Edmonton can catch up. And um, yeah, it's a real, real long shot at this point, even though they have a game against each other.
Hyman found out his dad can't buy a Pacific Division title. <laughs> Okay, uh, a lot of questions about tonight's game. You talked about Archer Seelovs. I'm very excited to see him again. Uh, this one from Jeremy Lee, regular listener of the show. Wise by the team to play Seelovs, it will give him valuable experience and management to consider in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I really like the decision to go with Seelovs. This is now four of the past six games that have now gone to Archer Seelovs. I thought about making a joke because at the optional morning skate today, Casey DeSmith and Thatcher Demko were also on the ice. But they were out late working with Ian Clark and Seelov skated off as the starter. So Batch tweeted out and I always tweet funny things at Batch and I was going to tweet at him and be like, oh, Seelov says past Demko and Smith on the Canucks depth chart. That'd be something. That'd be something. Yeah, it's a quads joke. That's a sure. quads joke. It's a quads joke. I, I did make the mistake of saying it was funny, but I laughed. I laughed. And someone out there did. Someone out there did. Got thousands of listeners. One of them laughed. One of them blew a little more air out of their nose. At least question for you guys. Give us the percentage of chance that she loves is the backup on opening night. Game one Canucks playoffs. Zero playoffs. Yeah, no zero. I've seen a lot. Of, and listen, I don't I want to make it clear. I'm not advocating for this, but I've seen a lot of Canucks fans thinking that, well, you got to have a guy who gives you the best chance to win. If the Smith gets another start here and craps himself again, is there any realm of possibility if the smith the craps himself again i hate saying that but <laughs> what one percent i move it up to one percent that the guy that is like see i was gonna be with the team he's a black ace like yeah. he's gonna be a black ace you'd assume well um you, you also think so? think he'll be, yeah do you think he'll be back in abbey because he isn't he up on an emergency call up yes, oh he is. yes so he is have yes. to be returned yes 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 zach Solchenko. <laughs> that poor guy Anyways, um, yeah, oh. no, it's it's to Smith, especially if you pull in the fact that they do probably want to start Sea Loves down in Abbotsford. Yeah, it's it's to Smith. The Smiths, this team's backup, barring an injury, of course. Um, to Smith is their backup on night one of the playoffs. Okay, I've found it, guys. My ballot? Your ballot. Pull it up, pull it up. And I can confirm that in 21 22. Oh, that's a tough That read. wasn't even my first year voting. Oh, you yes, had it was. Yes, it was. Tobias Bjornfoot as your third place for who, the lady. Who else did I have? I can't read it. Can you, you have it? Jack Hughes? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I try to blow it no, up. No, it's okay. Jack Hughes won. Jacob Slavin. Good picks. Wow. Well, I'm, on the first two are I'm on. Rasmus Sandin, Leaf Lover. And <laughs> uh, Jared Spurgeon, fifth. Those Spurgeon's also picks. a good one. So, so with the one exception. Okay. Sandin is also quite the stretch. <laughs> yeah. Where did that Sandin's come from? Sandin's a good pick, probably. Was he? He was playing what was third really, pair minutes? Yeah, in I was gonna say that must Look, have been his. I think we've established I didn't really understand the criteria for the award. Okay, <laughs> okay, but he said all of them except Bjorn fought four penalty minutes. Yeah, you but forgot to play at a high level. Whatever, play. exactly. Man. I, I, just gonna I say. said that. I said I didn't understand. Noted that leaf lover, David no, Pugler, noted leaf lover. Yes. <laughs> Let's man. pull up harms here and uh, guys kill some time as I try to try. Yeah, let's answer down. some anyone else's while you pull that up. Yeah. Um, we had this one <clears throat> and it's Jacoby asked this one. With Frank 90% certain of the Coyotes move to Utah. I, yeah, this is almost certainly the last time we'll ever see them in town. Save your virtual ticket stubs, everyone. This brings me to an interesting part of Frank's article that we didn't have time to get into because we had to talk to him about the Norris Trophy. One part of Frank's article, and I will read it verbatim because it was very interesting to me when I was writing it up for Canucks Army today. I wrote the Around the League and was looking at that article. Um, what he talked about was this idea that Alex Morello, the owner of the Arizona Coyotes, is going to sell for the team to be relocated to Utah, which is what we're talking about here. But they did make it clear that they do hope to win that land auction on June 27th. If they win that auction, Harmon, uh, they could build, you know, they could still build something. They were building this big complex. It wasn't just an ice rink that they were building. So if they build it, they could go to the NHL and say, okay, we'd like to come back as the Arizona Coyotes as an expansion team. This is the exact wording from Frank. Many questions remain, but one stands out with all of this happening behind the scenes. Why did the Coyotes release arena renderings and a strongly worded commitment to Arizona last week? Perhaps the answer is that Morello intends to win the June 27th land auction and develop that sports and entertainment district in the hopes of luring the NHL back to Arizona with a future expansion franchise. 
Sources said part of the agreement to sell now could include language that would allow Morello to reactivate the Coyotes franchise in future years, including name and trademarks, if a new arena is built and terms and condition of the agreement with the NHL are met. Further to this harm, uh, when he's talking about this, these two schedules, one that involves Arizona, one that involves Salt Lake City, Alex Morello, the owner of the Coyotes, is involved. Like He knows this is going on and he's very involved in this process. So that's a really interesting tidbit from Frank's article that I just wanted to make sure we highlighted because, yes, this is the end of the Arizona Coyotes at Mullet Arena, potentially, right? This franchise with all these players is going to move, but then the Arizona Coyotes could come back as an expansion franchise and hell would it be hard to believe like what would what would the what would the owner have to do to entice Gary Bettman to bring the NHL back to Arizona not much not much at all and I'll also say this when um previous to the mullet arena experiment now they used to play at a Glendale and I remember covering a game out there it's like 45 minutes away from Tempe it's far outside yep. of actual downtown yeah. Phoenix it's very inconveniently located so I actually think that if you had an arena in a central part of whether it's, you know, Phoenix itself, Scottsdale, a place where there's actually a, a vibrant, you know, community, there's there's people around there, a building's in the right place that I, I actually think that, put it this way, I have more confidence in that being successful than Atlanta in its third time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and the Coyotes tweeted out a video with a bunch of screen grabs of thumbnails, people chirping them, and they showed some highlights, and the caption is, committed to keeping Coyotes hockey in the desert and building an arena in Phoenix. I've been told by numerous people disregard everything from that Twitter account. Like, because it's like the owner's kid? Um, it was. It's not anymore, tweeting. apparently. It's not anymore. But top it comment, is, Mike Gould, keep tweeting through it, guys. It's a joke that social media team. That's all I'm going to say. And I'm comfortable saying that. I don't like to make fun of the work people do, but it's, I don't think they really have a clue what they're talking about when they tweet. Just going to say that. I don't think many people disagree. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm just going to go out and say that. I uh, just, yeah, disregard everything from that account is what I've been told. Like, yeah. they're, they're, a lot of times there's, there's been instances of them having to delete tweets. Because the team then sees what's being tweeted from the team. I just, it's a gong show. It's a gong show that, and again, this is, this is why they need to be moved. Get it over with. Get them out of there. You win your land auction. Sure. Come back as an expansion franchise, but get them out of there. Get them out of there. ASAP. This can't continue. Can't continue. Okay. All done. Did uh, you get all your Arizona stuff out? Yep. Grady, you got our ballots? I have harms here. Okay. Okay. So first place for the Lady Bing that year, harm had Jacob Slavin. Good pick. Which was a popular vote. Kyle Connor, two. Mika Zabinajad, three. Jared Spurgeon, which you had quads at five as his fourth. And then Joe Pavelski at fifth. Wow, very different ballots. Where's Rasmus Sandin? <laughs> Nowhere in sight. <laughs> I snubbed Bjornfot and you Sandin. Bjornfot's looking at his hockey reference page be like, one guy? One guy? Come on. Anyways. Well, hey, at least his friends and family members totally have something to cling on That's to right. like hey you earned an nhl aw uh, award vote they might have his hockey reference page hanging in their home like as a banner yeah it says awards <laughs> 51 bing yeah that's crazy <laughs> looking back on that that's so funny i yeah i voted how many seasons has it been since then 22 23 23 24 this is only my third year voting then yeah third year i'll tell you what you go look at last year's ballot I spent way too much time on that. There's zero mistakes on that ballot. Not, you won't hear me in three years be like, oh, I made a mistake on this ballot. No. And I'll tell you what, every ballot from now on, there ain't no mistakes. Was your first place votes at the actual award winner? Uh, yes. Of all of them. Even though I got very heavily criticized for putting Eric Carlson first, the way I weigh the Norris and weighed the Norris last year and the, the method I kind of figured out for myself is it's so hard to do all around defensemen. We've all heard the conversation about, yeah. okay, you got to have one for a defensive defenseman, one for the offensive defenseman. So I weigh the two things. I try to weigh them as equally as possible. Like I look at it as if you're playing fantasy baseball and you have pitching stats and batting stats. Okay. How's your offensive game? How's your defensive game? I try to assign a value to those two things. So for example, I think second place on my ballot, it wasn't McCarr. I think I put Hampus Lindholm second. He had a phenomenal year last yeah. year. Um, the way I weighed it was, okay, Eric Carlson's offensive game is up here. And if you're on the podcast, my hand is very high in the air. His defensive game, down here. 
Hampus Lindholm, and again, if you're on the podcast, my hand is very low. Hampus Lindholm is probably more in the middle, but again, I think that offensive game from Carlson was so above everybody and especially 100 points on the season for a defenseman. Um, I looked at it in that way and said, okay, this should be the winner and I should vote accordingly. You yeah. had Carlson, Quinn Hughes, too. Oh, yeah. Hampus I did Lindholm have Quinn Hughes, three, too. Adam Fox, Dougie yeah. Hamilton. So I was ahead of Hughes before anybody else. Wow. Quinn Hughes, too. I didn't expect that. Yeah. I, I, I don't regret I it. I think I Hughes. Harm, do you remember picks. yours? Yeah, I, was, I have yours here. I don't regret Hughes um, I think at I two. Carlson. Did I have Carlson or Fox? I can't you had remember. Fox one, Carlson right, yeah. two, Lindholm three, McCarr four, Hughes five. Yeah, I, I can also tell you Hughes will be the only Canuck I vote for this year. Past, like I think I think Pedersen was either fourth or fifth on my heart last year because he did have Hart a great or year. Selke. Uh, I can't remember one of the two, but he, there's not going to be any other Canuck other than Hughes on maybe fifth place Hart and first place Norris. But again, I don't want to. I haven't done all my research yet, so I'm not going to yeah. come out and say this is my fifth place heart. Um, yeah, I all I know is Quinn Hughes is going to be number one on my Norris ballot. Like he was two last year. He deserved it last year too. Like I would argue he he really did. He had a really good year last year. Anyways, and again, I waited with that same system. Like I'm taking this. I'm, I'm taking curious this how seriously. Pedersen will look in um, in Bing conversation. Oh, all penalty Bing. minutes. Yeah, that'll be interesting. But. I think he throws his weight around too much now. But if you do it in a clean way, that's fair. That's fair. It isn't who's the softest but, but, player. But go look at go look at the Lady Bing Trophy. Isn't it typically guys who aren't throwing hits? And H- Pedersen's quietly dirty. Let's be honest here. Wait, what? Pedersen's quiet, quietly. I mean, no, I shouldn't uh, say that. He's not. No. no, no. I just think he he has too much of that killer instinct. And again, I'm Maybe. saying it, I'm saying it more as a compliment. Like I don't mean dirty. I just mean like hit him from behind and he's going to take a run at you. And it's not going to be a dirty hit. Right, yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I get what you mean. I'm just looking at the guys who have won the Lady yeah. Bing and the way Elias Patterson plays, which I respect the hell out of, he probably isn't deserving of that award. But again, like a guy like Ryan O'Reilly won the award in 2013-14. And he hits. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's so interesting going through it all. But again... I don't know. I haven't decided on anything yet, except for Quinn Hughes Norris, number one. Yeah, I haven't either besides Hughes for, for cool. Norris. I'm uh, uh, leaning McKinnon. McKinnon I am also leading McKinnon Hart. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just think the goal differential for Kucherov being that good, well, it goes back to the weighted yeah. system, right? Like, you're so bad defensively that you're a plus nine, but you've got 139 points on the year. I will say, it was interesting. Uh, I think it was Jason Greger. Who, yes, I, I know this tweet. Yeah, who pointed out goal differential like on the ice versus off, and yeah, Kucherov's on ice goal differential isn't very good, and that's still part of the reason yeah. why defensively, like I have him behind McKinnon as of now. Yeah, but Tampa's minus twenty five is a five on five goal differential uh, without Kucherov, whereas McKinnon, like the abs are still. This is positive. such a good point because the verbiage of the award, which you should read, folks, if you're yes. ever voting, is that you're the most valuable player to your team. What do the Tampa Bay Lightning look like without Nikita oh, Kucherov? The no point game. differential no, no between play, no playoff. Kucherov and Braden Point. So Kucherov's 139 points. Mm-hmm. Braden Point, 86. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's night and day. So again, yeah, there's a really, really good um, case to be made for Kucherov. Okay. Squirrels. A lot of squirrel chat. People saying vote for the squirrels. Did we do the DoorDash read? No, we didn't. It's time for anyone else. <laughs> Presented by DoorDash. It's our listener's chance to get involved in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listener's chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's all capital letters in the numbers. Wait, no. That's all capital letters NATION and the numbers 25. Offer valid in Canada. Subject change. Terms do. Apply, check out Double Dash. Multiple restaurants or stores in the same delivery without additional delivery fees. Everyone can get what they want and need. Promo code is NATION25 on DoorDash with your first order. Okay, let's get to some. I've got some here. Uh, Top G, if you were the NHL commissioner for one day, what would you change? My height. Um, <laughs> what? What? My height. Couple reasons. It's a joke on Gary Bettman being short. I'm also not the tallest guy. You seen this surgery? They extend oh, yeah. your leg. 
they no they break your leg in a yeah. bunch of spots the, i think it's a cat yeah. and uh, the femur yeah and you have to like learn how to walk again Jeez. you seen gary Bemman walk <laughs> all that to put six feet on your dating profile hey harm and you can just it's, do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's you're walking yeah. on your tippy toes at your first date. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, seriously. What would you change? I would change the tanking system. I would immediately take the PWHL, what they've done with. Uh, we've talked about this on the Gold show plan. before. Yeah. I would uh, immediately me, implement that. Uh, give me one to eight playoff format. Yeah. Yes. Hell yeah. Conference. Yes. Need that. Three points for regulation win. Mm hmm. Yes, I'd be into something like that. Get uh, rid of the Also, shooter. Pierre Lebrun had a great piece today pitching the NHL, like pitching his, uh, like what he would do for an NHL schedule if he um, was commissioner. And his idea is basically start the season earlier, right? Hmm. Start it in, in September. I, I, think, I think he says target around September 20th. Uh, and then basically push everything uh earlier so that your season ends at the end of may rather than june which makes sense yeah. by the time june rolls around the weather's super nice yeah and look yeah. you're still watching playoff hockey but when the sun's shining out and you barely get sun in canada you want to go enjoy that yeah. right plus it feels like june is too crazy of a month if the stanley cup finals go deep and then immediately you, you have the the draft and then why is free agency on so canada day? soon yeah but also why is it on, on canada, canada day? day this is the thing that every family member, and I'm sure you're in the exact same boat. Wait, you have to work on Canada Day? Why is Canada Day one of the busiest days of your year? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So I'll tell you what. Right after I'm done with that surgery, I am, I am moving free agency for sure. And I like the ideas that you brought up. Those are really, really good ideas. People are giving us their Lady Bing votes. Uh, Karn, Matt Rempe for Lady Bing. <laughs> uh, this one from Cali Canuck the back to the game. Lady Bing. Oh, we forgot to man. I am okay. We gotta talk about four wins brewing and our light the lamp contest because Vancouver is playing Arizona tonight, and we want to know who's gonna score the first goal for Vancouver. If you nail it, you could win a twenty-five dollar gift card to the Four Wins Tap Room located at Seventy Second and River Road in Delta. Enter by following us on social media. Keep an eye out for today's show clip and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army on Twitter, CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure you ask about Four Wins Light Light Logger at your local liquor store, or have some delivered to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. I am going with Elias Pedersen because it leads me into a comment here on anyone else. Do you have a pick? Yeah, assuming he doesn't get taken out of the lineup in favor of Elias Lindholm, I'm going to go with Pia Suters to snap his go. uh, gold route. Let's go. Callie Canuck, does PD break out tonight? I'd like him to get eight points in the last four games. He's played well. Like he's He was good against LA. Um, and he was good on Monday night too. The point totals aren't necessarily there, but I've liked his game. I'm gonna, that's why I'm going with him to score tonight. I think he does break out tonight. I like that pick. I was going to pick him, but I was like, I, I take too many of the top players in these picks, I, and I don't go off the board enough. So I wanted to go off the board. I like Keep the I like hot the hand, too. Connor. I like it, Connor Garland. Beautiful. This is one from Nar Garland or Joshua for the next three years. Same cap hit. Pick one. What's Garland at? 4.85? 4.95. 4.95. Uh, Garland. Garland. Yeah. Too high. Too high uh, for Dakota Joshua there. Um, this what would be Captain the Kinnock. max, quickly, what would be the maximum amount of AAV you'd be okay stomaching for Dakota Joshua? Four years, or excuse me, four million on the dot. Yeah. That's the max. Is that too high for you, Harm? Probably. It's a bit high. Yeah. I think three and a half is yeah. where... Uh, where I might be comfortable. And again, part of this is people may look at that and go, and even somebody like me in the past would have been like, well, this is the only year he's provided top nine value. What gives you the confidence that, like last year was a fourth line. Great point. Like, is that too much of a risk? But I don't know, looking at Joshua's skill set, the skill that he has net front, uh, developing into a reliable PK1 option, the defensive impact, the have to win board battles, the chemistry that he has with uh, with Garland, being one of the NHL's leading hitters, I think he's a player that's really hard to replace. And I seeing him up the lineup in the top six right now, he hasn't looked out of place at all. Like that line has been playing really well. It gives you confidence that hey, this this guy is 
trending towards being a legit middle six winger. And if you view him as a legit middle six winger, then three and a half, I think, is uh, is fair, even though we haven't seen a really long track record of it. Especially with the cap going up, too. Like, that could actually add some pretty good value. And I think Dom did an article on The Athletic about uh, that recently, Harm. Kind of just looking at the projection of what uh, over, you know, the next few years of what he would look at in that kind of three, three and a half range. So. This is a couple in, a couple interesting ones I want to get to. These go back to the question we had about being the commissioner and what you would change. Captain Canuck, I would change the delay of game penalties. It's so stupid. Make it up to the ref if he thinks it was done intentionally. Then give a delay of game penalty. I was at a BCHL game last night. I was at the Coquitlam Express game. Um, a puck was cleared over the glass and nobody reacted. And I, it was a Coquitlam player. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that's a horrible penalty to take. What the hell are you doing? And nobody reacted. And they just went for a D zone draw. And I'm like looking around. I'm like, Everybody saw that hit the netting, right? And the guy I was with, uh, uh, we know him, Jacob. We were at the game together, and I was like, wasn't that a penalty? He's not in this league. Like, oh, interesting. You can't change, but it's not a penalty to put the puck over the glass. Uh, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, I don't have strong feelings on uh, the delay of game. I don't agree with leaving it to a judgment call. Putting any more power in the ref's hands <laughs> and getting them to judge oh was this intentional or not i yeah. don't agree with that because i don't trust the refs to to make the right call there i don't hate how it's currently done called your kid Petey. he's thinking i like this this is the only answer we've had about the commissioner being the commissioner about like how can i make more money and hey if gary bettman's watching this we might we might see this in the nhl because you know he's looking at making money i called a kid Petey in the chat i would put a glass dome just like table hockey and save a fortune on pucks Taking bubble hockey to a whole new level. All right. Um, Top G asking if I've gone to Riverway Golf Course. Yeah, I have, and I've played very poorly, um, just like most golf courses I've ever gone to. I did that with Faber last year. That was not good. Not a good showing. I don't like all those hills, but it's a nice golf course. Captain Canuck, is Matthews going to stay a Maple Leaf now? I don't think he was ever going to bolt to Arizona. I know the narrative's out there, and because he's the hometown kid, but you're telling me that that guy in the prime of his career is going to go to a team that has shown time and time again that they can't win. When's he UFA? Three years from now, right? Uh, he sent four year. So three years. Is Coyotes, a- Coyotes might be back in Arizona by then. Maybe. Oh, gosh. And they might have a different look. We'll see. Yeah, he's not going back there. No. He might, though. He might. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Um. <clears throat> yeah, this is good. <laughs> we got some good contributions in the chat. That I'm not going to read on air, but there's some in there that are making me laugh about the Utah expansion <laughs> franchise. Same um, comments we had on S P today. The too. best, the best. Those People are spitballing those random are names. Solid, solid comments. But we won't read them. We won't read those on air. Family show, family show. Um, okay. Did you have anything else that you wanted to get to in anyone else before I close it out here? Nope. Okay. Well, I'm gonna tell you about something before we go. I'm excited to tell you about it. We're gonna be there. It'll be a great time on. Saturday, April 20th at 1 p.m. at the Hollywood Theater in Kitsilano. Join us and the rest of the Canucks Army crew for a special tribute to our late friend Jason Botchford presented by Fountain Tire. Bro, Do Your Playoffs is a media event celebrating the life and legacy of Jason that will feature shared memories, special guests, an exclusive performance from the matinee, and the celebration of Vancouver's triumphant return to the playoffs. This event is presented by Fountain Tire. Uh, make the shift to more savings. Save up 25% on select tires until April 20th, plus a bonus $50 off any service of $150 more. Book your appointment at fountaintire.com. Some restrictions apply as we head further into spring. Ask the Fountain Tire experts about their seasonal car package, car care package, excuse me, to keep your vehicle in top shape. Find your nearest service dealer at fountaintire.com. As I said, bro, do your playoffs is in support of the BC Mental Health Foundation. Get your tickets now at nationgear.ca for just $10. I got a Nation Gear order recently. Got this shirt. How are those Mariners doing? uh, I think they beat the Jays just now. Oh, they got a win. Yeah, they did. Man, their starting pitching is so... I know you're not actually asking, so I won't divulge, but I could talk about them. (laughs) No, you (laughs) could Just on that uh, Botchford event there, I don't know if folks have seen it, but there is quite the guest list of people that will be coming out from all factions of the Vancouver media market. So if you can haven't you, got your Can you share it, them with us? Because I don't know. 
Uh, well, we got the G-Man, Tony Gallagher. Nice. We have Kat Botchford there. Nice. Thomas Drance, Jason Bruff, Mike Halford, Wyatt the Stanchion's going to be there. Uh, PJ is going to be there. Matt and Blake, you two. Um, who else? Who else? I'm sure there'll be more. I'm forgetting some. But when you said you two, I was like, oh, that's <laughs> awesome. They're performing. Remember when you two. The matinee will be performing live. I remember when you two back in. I don't even remember what year. I, th- I remember being in like grade seven or eight. They just downloaded some random playlist on everybody's phones. Yes. Was that with the iPod Reds? Do you remember that? Yeah. That's what? Some- yeah. Yeah. Like no, it I don't was remember forced that. downloaded on everybody's iPod or, or iPhone. Oh my gosh. I remember being like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Quads haven't even heard music yet at that point of his life. Man, that's like state appointed music. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It was wild. Wow. There are places in the world where that just happens. You're just gonna get this is this is what you're listening to today. Yeah. yeah. It like auto downloaded. Like I had to like remove it from my phone. It was eating up storage. That's so funny. There's too many bits flying through my head, and I'm not going to deliver any of them. I'm going to keep. I was going to start myself. singing with or without you. When was that you were on doing there? The Wow chart earlier. Oh, because that's essentially. What hey, it speaking means. of you two, streets have no name. Where the streets have no name. Are you hoping the Canucks come out to that? I'm unequivocally yes. I'm kind of torn. I I don't know. The you vibes would be great, slippers. but sometimes new era, right? Yeah. Do you want to create something different that? Is also memorable. Mm-hmm. Although, why else would have they been playing it? That when remember when we did Jeff uh, a couple of weeks back when he was at Rogers and they were playing that in the background and he, they were saying that they're kind of gearing up for the playoffs. Was well, that they a, do play it like that's isn't that their entrance song right now? Or they've used it sometimes. No, so. They've no, used it. Not. They used it last year for sure because I was at oh, the okay. games last year. I don't go as much anymore. It's in Wyatt. I'll be going to playoffs though. We'll alternate. They play this like playing in, rank. That's right for playoffs. That's right. Not even writing on the game. Just- no, I always write. Okay, I don't know where this perception comes from. I write instant reaction. I'm one of the only media members writing while I'm there. Everybody stays later. I write instant reaction during the game. It's out moments after the game. So you can and then I run as quick as possible. <laughs> That's part of it. You're not, <laughs> you're not there grinding until midnight like Wagner and Wyatt is. No, absolutely not. Instant reaction doesn't take that long. But hey, guess what? I gotta wait for not Wagner, but I gotta wait for Wyatt to submit the stanchies and then write it or edit edit them. And so, you play the show. I do play the show. Always bring it back to baseball. That's right. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, we'll close it out there. Is there anything else I missed? There's so much right now that I just keep missing. But I think we're good. Yeah, I think we nailed everything. So we'll close it out there. For my co-host, Harmon Dialer, and our technical producer, Grady Sass, my name is Dave Woodrelli. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric the best part by choosing electric you can get up to eleven thousand dollars in rebates and incentives the bz4x are in stock and selling quickly so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local pacific toyota dealer to get your hands on one canucks conversation is live monday through friday every weekday at 2 p.m over on the canucks army youtube channel make sure you like subscribe and interact in the youtube live chat every day with us folks